We'll now call 124-442, State of Kansas versus Mark Edward Baldwin. May it please the court. I'm James Latta of the Appellate Defender's Office. Again, I'm representing Mark Baldwin. Um, we're here today on a narrow issue of what the state has to prove in order to prove that a substance or a substance is alleged to be marijuana is actually marijuana. And I've actually been raising this issue since before the legislature uh, legalized industrial hemp. And I still think I was right before the legislature legalized industrial hemp. Every time I raise this issue, I'm taken back to my fifth grade class here in Avondale West, here in Topeka, Kansas, uh, which closed down. But I'm reminded of my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Clark. And Mrs. Clark always told her fifth graders, you cannot define a word by using the word itself. And that's what's happening in all these marijuana cases. State of Kansas is saying, this is marijuana because it's marijuana, so it's marijuana. Now, that could work if we were talking about a substance that did not have a definition. But here we have one. And the definition is it came from the cannabis plant. In this case, we have no evidence that the alleged substance came from the cannabis plant. Based on that fact alone, there is insufficient evidence that the alleged that the substance alleged to be marijuana is in fact marijuana under the legal definition. Is there any marijuana that doesn't come from the cannabis plant? I don't know. And that by definition, I, I, have, I have no idea. I mean, that that's why we need marijuana is a product derived from the cannabis plant, right? Correct. Right. So when you testify that it's marijuana, why isn't that enough to presume that it complies with the statutory definition? Because why would the legislature define something as itself? The, the fact that they say marijuana comes from the cannabis plant just self-evident that it's something different than marijuana, that what comes from the cannabis plant is different than marijuana itself. What about Kleenex? Do you have to define Kleenex as a facial paper tissue or has Kleenex metamorphosized in the English language such as Kleenex? So I, I would say, I, I would give two responses. I would say you would still need testimony saying that this that what we allege to be Kleenex is actually a paper tissue. And if this court doesn't like that answer, then I would say that Kleenex is much different than a plant, a drug. I mean, we've, we've had the KBI come in and testify about drugs for decades. I mean, what? so we're going to start objecting to the KBI coming in and saying this is common knowledge. We don't need them. Well, Kroger might agree them. with you, but aren't we talking about what the general lay person on a jury would understand? Sure, and my response would be though, a lay person on the jury would not know that does all marijuana come from the cannabis plant? Could marijuana come from a different plant? I, I don't know the answer to that. That's why just because we know some can, Maybe all doesn't. We still need ex we still need I thought your argument was the reverse of that. Not that marijuana can come from some other plant, but that things other than marijuana also come from the cannabis plant. I mean, that's all my argument. My my argument is number one, they have to have testimony that says this substance came from the cannabis plant. Number two, they have to have evidence that says it's not the mature stock, it's not industrial hemp. Uh and and doesn't come from schedules two through four, two through two through five. So it's both. They have to prove both. Do the exceptions ever apply apply to a cigarette? The exceptions? Exceptions that you just mentioned. We have a cigarette here. Wait, I'm sorry, what you're on? The Honor? cigarette. The that's what the officer saw. The the blunt or the cigarette. That that was a cigarette. Do any of the exceptions apply to um, cigarette. I, I see what you're saying. So you're saying for the fourth exception where it says industrial hemp when uh, when possessed or used for activities authorized by the Commercial Industrial Hemp Act is what you're talking about. Okay. Uh, yes, as I have read the Industrial Hemp Act, it's it's tough to read. 
I do not read where just possessing by itself industrial hemp is illegal. There is a statute that says distributing and manufacturing industrial hemp cigarettes is illegal, but I cannot find anywhere where it says just having industrial hemp by itself is illegal. Um, so to back up a little bit, for your honor, in that in that exception or exemption or whatever we want to call it, it has an or in there. So it says when cultivated, produced, possessed, or used. So my, my first response would be we have no evidence in here that that industrial hemp wasn't initially cultivated or produced for approved purposes. Perhaps there's evidence that it's not possessed or used currently. Then if the court doesn't like that answer, my next answer is just taking away the definition of marijuana itself, the fact that the legislature enacted and made a substance called industrial hemp, which has a lower percentage THC, that is a new substance they created. Industrial hemp is not found anywhere in the Controlled Substances Act. Industrial hemp, the THC in industrial hemp is specifically exempted from THC found in Schedule 1. So my argument is reading all, all the statutes together, as this court has emphasized recently, whenever somebody possesses a substance and it has below 0.3 THC in it, it's not illegal. We can look at the industrial hemp. I can't find anywhere that says simply possessing it is illegal. It's a new substance found nowhere in the Controlled Substances Act. So let me Go ahead. jump in real quick and just take you back to an evidentiary question. This is based on your your appeal is entirely based on evidence, this sufficient evidence, correct? Yes. Um, and clearly in the record, the uh, law enforcement testified that he found marijuana cigarettes, correct? Yes. Strikes me that your argument is essentially that this is impermissible expert testimony, or this is imper impermissible testimony because he's not an expert in defining marijuana. Fair. It requires well, I, expert testimony sure. to separate out industrial hemp from from illegal marijuana. Sure, that'd be part of it. I would also add that even with that, have, even with that testimony, we still have insufficient evidence. Well, we, why? When he says it's marijuana, I mean that's evidence. Because that it's marijuana. I mean, I, to, so my but, but 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 my actual follow up question really was. Why doesn't your claim fail because of a lack of objection here? Because my entire argument is even with that evidence, we still have insufficient evidence. He did not testify to say it's marijuana is not enough because the legislature gave a definition. We do not know that the alleged I don't understand that argument at all. Okay. So if it's if someone testifies, you know, person A killed person B. They don't need to testify as to the definition, the legal definition of homicide or whatever. That's evidence. There is no legal definition of homicide is how I distinguish that. It, if, if, if we have oxycodone at issue and the officer testifies- You're making an argument about expert testimony, not sufficiency. That's how it strikes me. Okay. Do you see that distinction? I, I understand what you're saying, and I, I do. I disagree. Okay, fair enough. I mean- so I do disagree. I think. Let, let me uh, let me piggyback. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, go ahead. No, uh, on Justice Stegall's question, what I'm trying to envision in a possession of marijuana case under your theory, what would need to be produced as evidence, and how would that happen? I mean, you have to differentiate the, the origin of the THC, whether it comes from stock, whether this or that. How would that functionally happen? And I was thinking along the same lines. Are you suggesting then that it would take expert testimony at every possession of marijuana trial to prove that it's marijuana? So tell me how that would sure. work. So my, and, my first response is we shouldn't worry about how that happens. The legislature said this is how you prove marijuana. I mean, I remember in law school 101, when we have a definition, we plug that definition in for the thing. We shouldn't, We you know, we we seem to be worried anytime we make it harder to get a conviction. I mean, we're oh, no, beyond a reasonable doubt. That, I, I'm just wondering what is the burden on the state? At, at, the at burden on the state would be theory. to produce evidence that this alleged substance that they're alleging to be marijuana came from the cannabis plant. It's not in schedules two through five. It's not industrial hemp, uh, and it's and the green vegetative substance is not the mature stalks of the plant. That's the evidence they need to produce. And I mean, it's laid out right there for them. 
Um, that becomes what the state has to prove only if we accept your argument that that is part of the definition and that those four things are not exceptions that are affirmative defenses. Why didn't that need to be litigated in the trial court? How has this been preserved for this court has always said whenever we're doing insufficiency of evidence. But how can how we are not then talking about sufficiency that presents to us a question of law about what is the definition that to me is something different than sufficiency, which would we would reach once we determine that question about um, that procedural question, that burden of proof question. Sure. Um, and and how can it be fair not to ferret that out at the district court when that burden of proof has to be met? Sure. I, I, I suppose I, I don't really see the difference. I, I just see my argument as a statutory interpretation saying that where it says marijuana is not, these are we're contesting an element, which means it's not an affirmative defense. Uh, so the state has to prove it. There was nothing to litigate below. We've we've done statutory interpretation repeatedly whenever we're doing sufficiency arguments. I mean, that's part of the course. And I would also say that the Court of Appeals reviewed this issue and the state didn't petition anything. Uh, so that's also not before this court. Right, there may be preservation issues both ways, but we see, we've, we see this happening um, in several cases where things are lumped as a sufficiency argument, but they have embedded within them sub, sub issues, if you will. And I guess the question becomes, does everything fall under that large, for our standard of review, that large sufficiency question, or do we have to divide that into those sub-issues and require that some of those sub-issues be I mean, I, I don't, at least discuss what under a different standard of review? I don't I don't see any procedural issues with this. Uh, I don't the only sub-issue I see, if you want to call it a sub-issue, is statutory interpretation. The evidence is the evidence. No, if the objections that weren't made, that's what you know. I have to live with. Uh, I don't. I don't understand what you know. If they would have raised this issue below, we're we're still at the same place we are now. I, I've never seen where for sufficiency they had to make some argument uh, below to preserve it, even if it involves statutory interpretation. Well, the other example, the other recent place where this has happened is on the definition of knife, and the the arguments about what that means. And one side will take a different position where if, it, if this was laid out, the jury could have been instructed. Um, you know, same thing here. The instructions may have changed. Um, all of those things seem to be, if you're asking for a sufficiency, it seems that those things need to be presented to the jury. Um, so here we're not even getting to the point where issues are presented to a jury. And yet we're asking uh, to look into the crystal ball about what a jury did or did not do or might have done. Sure, my, my response would be that sufficiency of the evidence, that issue doesn't care about any of that stuff. We're just, we we have the definition of marijuana that the state has to prove per the legislature, and the state is not doing it, you know, in every marijuana case. And th this issue is right before this court. I mean, there's other, there could be other issues as well, instructional issues, uh, evidentiary issues. And so, that's why I focus on the sufficiency issue because it's right here. It's before this court. We have all the evidence in the case. Sufficiency doesn't care about objections or what was raised below. We have to look to see if there was sufficient evidence to uphold this conviction. And based on this definition of marijuana, not a definition that I'm trying to bring in, you know, like say dagger. I'm not trying to give a dagger a definition. This is the definition provided by the legislature. This is what the, the state has. So just to, to be clear, to your argument is in every criminal case, when there's an element that has a definition, the state can't just simply refer to the element has to, it has, the evidence has to go to the definition. So battery, for example, that you can't just get a, somebody on the witness stand to say, you know, committed battery, punched a guy, whatever. You've got to walk through the definition as a matter of evidence. No, no, because these, these cases are different because we're dealing with scientific stuff here and we're in, in uh, battery cases. If you say you battered someone, that, that's that's both an element and a factual term. We know what you mean. We know you caused physical contact or you caused bodily harm. It's different than saying uh, I have a... So it goes to the technicality of the definition. A absolutely. That's what makes this different. 
is this is scientific stuff by nature that the legislature wanted the state to prove. This is the only, uh, I won't say only, one of the few drugs that the legislature actually gave a definition to. And it's a technical definition because drugs are of themselves science-based. I mean, the legislature is basically, I mean, I think it, it's a fair reading of this to say the legislature wanted the state to present expert testimony in every marijuana case. Let me just test. Oh, I was going to say, let me just test the how how broadly we, we should view your argument. So if the state puts on like a KBI lab expert and testifies, I know the definition of marijuana in our state, this was marijuana. And that's the extent of the testimony. Is that sufficient evidence? Absolutely not. How is the jury ever to decide whether whether or not it came from the cannabis plant? You have to provide them that opportunity to find find for themselves. Um, this there, I understand that you are arguing these are uh, the the four uh, subparts are not affirmative defenses, um, and I understand your grammatical con or the arguments you make about the way the, the statute's worded, but I want to focus on whether uh, what what and how we handle situations like this and like a Rose and Brazel, where essentially what the state would have to do under your argument is to prove negative propositions that really are no way for the state to, to prove. The Brazel case is maybe easier to explain it. There it was, the question was, did he have a prescription? Uh, for the medication. Well, how is the state ever going to be able to prove that somewhere in all of the pharmacies of the world or all the doctors in the world, a defendant did not have a prescription written? Sure. So why when we're when the legislature writes in a negative proposition like that, shouldn't we assume that they intend that to be an affirmative defense? Sure. So so I would distinguish your example in Brazil because uh, for the prescriptions, we're moving on to another subsection, which is uh, 2015702, which says this act doesn't apply if it's authorized by the Controlled Substance Act other or authorized by law. So I'm going to guess that this court, when it comes to it, is going to read that as an affirmative defense. So for your prescription, uh, whether or not you have a prescription does not contest any of the elements of whether or not someone possessed oxycodone. So I think reading... The crime itself, the elements, 215702, uh, together, this court will say that's an affirmative defense. Here, here's the difference, though. The legislature specifically said marijuana is not these things, uh, in addition to 215702. I, to me, in it, so based on the plain language alone, where the legislature said this element is not these things, they wanted the state to disprove them. Number two, it doesn't make sense to me that the state would make two affirmative defenses, 215702, and then also make marijuana is not an affirmative defense. And then finally, I'll point to when the legislature does want to make an affirmative defense, they have explicitly said it, and they explicitly said it in 215706, where they were talking about uh, cannabidiol treatment. They said this is an affirmative defense. When when the legislature, we, we keep worrying about what the state has to prove, you know, the legislature not it's not even the defense the legislature apparently didn't care the legislature said marijuana is not these things therefore you have to disprove them uh that's my technical reading of the plain language and then also reading all the statutes together is is why they have to disprove that thank you thank you Um, may it please the court, excuse me, uh, Chris Elslager appearing on behalf of the state. Um, I will admit uh, th there were parts of my opposing counsel's argument I just, I, I couldn't follow for sure. Uh, and I'm not sure, I, it strikes me that his argument would present an impossible burden on the state. I'm not sure what evidence the state could then rely on to prove possession of marijuana. So I, I want to roll back to, I want to start simple and go back to the the laws that exist now, um, and and the uh, under the standard of review for sufficiency of evidence, which is viewing the evidence the light most favorable to the state. Could any rational finder of fact you know find the defendant guilty? 
And just as the Court of Appeals found here, um, that is certainly the case. I mean, we have the evidence from the police officer who visually identified, uh, based on his training and experience, the, the substance that he found as marijuana. He also let's said say, he smelled... Uh, hypothetically, if, if let's take a different case where what's discovered is uh, like a, a gummy thing. And a law enforcement officer says, well, that's that's marijuana. I mean, I, I get that it's like, well, I'm not so sure because this definition is highly technical and there has to be concentrations above certain thresholds, et cetera. And I, maybe this was to Justice Stiegel's point that maybe that officer isn't qualified to render that sort of opinion in that sort of case w would you agree with with that well i think there's so, that different hypothetical of course but that brings up about three different strands of thought in my head one is because of the hypothetical we've changed the facts well maybe sure. maybe the training that officer and his training experience has never seen a gummy he can't do that i i don't know mm -hmm. second it almost comes to, to like uh, somebody brought up is, is it's almost like expert testimony then well that should have some kind of objection from the from the defendant i guess and that's my I, point is is expert opinion is expert testimony required given the legislature's definition of marijuana uh not necessarily i think and there's 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 case law uh to that extent but in this case we also did have expert testimony we had the the uh the kbi lab chemist who tested and said it was she found thc which she testified was the psycho what's called the psychoanalytic or element of uh uh, of marijuana. I mean, that's what right. she said. It's it, THC is the, but not the, at the threshold that trigger the division between not at, not necessarily, she didn't identify the threshold quantities that necessarily would put it into a prohibited versus a permissible. Uh, right. But you know, the defendant didn't, didn't challenge that. He, he, he didn't object. He didn't, he didn't say that she didn't meet that threshold. So it stands as it is. She said it was the THC was what's found in marijuana. And I think based on that, that's sufficient uh, with, the, again, coupled with the officer's testimony, plus the context where it was found and how it was found in the cellophane wrapper and rolled up in a little cigarette. Um, I, and I, I hate to draw up hypotheticals to you because that's kind of what we're doing here. But um, what if the testimony was that the THC level in the sample found didn't reach the threshold. Well, that would certainly be a different situation. I understand um, that. Although, but, but is it is is that now a a substance that's not illegal? No, I mean if you you have to look at the, the I think it's the Bridget case that said, well, I mean, in that case they didn't find any THC, but the court looked at the definition of marijuana and said, well, it's not absolutely necessary to find THC. THC is an indicator of marijuana, but it's not it's not required. <laughs> Right. So that's a situation where the state could still say, look, this is marijuana. And I think it would be incumbent upon the defendant to raise, oh, oh no, wait, that's that's hemp. If if that's what I mean, as, as if it was an affirmative defense. And, and I think that you, when you look at these exemptions to the, the definition of marijuana, they really should be treated as affirmative defenses. Um, and I, I don't quite I, I don't agree with his argument that affirmative defenses uh, don't negate an element of the crime because, uh, for example, the mental disease or defect defense is an affirmative defense that only negates the uh, intent element of a specific intent crime. So there's no talismanic language that is required for, uh, for uh, an affirmative defense. I looked up the, the definition of affirmative defense in Black's Law Dictionary, and it just says, a defendant's assertion raising new facts and arguments that, if true, will defeat a plaintiff's or prosecution's claim, even if all allegations in the complaint are true. So yeah, I mean, it's just raising a challenge to the state's case. The state's made its prima facie case. So, look, this is this has got THC. It's marijuana. We, you know, it, it walks like a duck and talks like a duck. So we think it's a duck, and and the defendant can say, no, it's not a duck. It's it's hemp. And here's our proof. Um, otherwise, you know, to to follow his interpretation of the statute would lead, I believe, to an absurd result, because not only is is hemp excluded uh, from the the definition of marijuana, there's you know, a whole laundry list of things. One of those is, you know, subsection two says any substance listed in schedules two through five of the Uniform Controlled Substances Act. Now, before this argument, I'd never really looked at the schedules two through five of the Uniform Substances Act, but I, I did. I went to the statutes, uh, let's see, starting with KSA 654107, and I printed them out, and it is it, it is a list, I mean, a laundry list of, of things. So by his, his uh, rationale, to, not only would the state have to prove this marijuana, we would have to also disprove 
uh, that it's not uh, raw opium, not opium extracts, not opium fluid, not powdered opium, not granulated opium, not tinctured opium, not codeine, not ethylomorphine, not ectomorphine hydrochloride, not hydrocodone, not hydromorphine, and the list goes on and on and on and on, and that's just Schedule 2. And then we go to Schedule 3, and, and you can look in the statute books. I mean, it's, it is, I'll use my demonstrative evidence here. I mean, it's it's just list after list after list. And by his rationale, the state would have to disprove all of that. Uh, and then I don't know. We might also have to disprove that uh, prove that it's not oregano, it's not parsley, it's not uh, anything. I mean, we have to disprove everything that it could possibly be, and that's that's not the case law. And and if you follow his rationale, that would definitely lead to an absurd result. And and we know it's a, there's a, a maximum of, of statutory interpretation that we we avoid absurd results. We presume that it is marijuana, and we also presume that it has less than the point three level of, of THC, THC. Yeah. also marijuana? Uh, it, it can be. Uh, again, you, you go, I go back to the Bridget case where there was no THC found and that they were able to prove that based on other evidence that it was from the cannabis plant and that it was marijuana. The THC is just an indicator. It, it tells it, it's, um, it, it tells you that yeah, this could, this is this is could be marijuana. It's just one indicator, just like you know the the smell that the officer testified to, just like the the visual uh, that the officer testified to. It's it's one thing. It's not the defining thing. It's one thing that helps define marijuana. Helps us prove that it's marijuana. Um, then if if it was like only I don't know point two percent or whatever whatever the threshold is. I think then the defendant would have to come back as an affirmative defense and say, look, it doesn't meet the threshold. This was industrial hemp. And he would have to establish that and have to have some kind of evidence of that. And of course, the, the other element I think I think that you you got to in this is that you know industrial hemp is only excluded uh, from the definition of marijuana when it's used for a lawful purpose. And the statute itself on the, the Commercial Hemp Act defines, uh, let me find the statute number, KSA 2-3908, says that uh, it's unlawful for to, to have cigarettes containing industrial hemp. Uh, also, something about, there's somewhere in there also about seeds and... and, and uh, 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 but his point is that it's to make and not, it doesn't use the word possess. But it still would not be used for lawful purpose, so it wouldn't fall into the exemption of hemp within the definition of marijuana. But regardless, I mean, he can't, he can't make the claim that he, even if it was hemp, that he had it for lawful purpose. Your your position then is that even if it's marijuana, or if it's marijuana, even if it has less than 0.3 THC, it's still an illegal marijuana cigarette. Potentially, it puts it is. I think for for the potentially, then my immediate reaction is why is why have you not proved beyond a reasonable doubt then that he's because what I'm saying is is he has the opportunity to raise as a, as an affirmative defense that it's not marijuana. Uh, but under the Bridget case, sir, certainly just because it's below 0.3% or whatever, doesn't mean it's not marijuana. Okay, THC is one indicator. It The, the marijuana could maybe not have as much THC as as uh, could be below 3% and still be marijuana. There's other other things that make it marijuana. Uh, and that's what the Bridget case said. You look at the, you know, the, did it come from the cannabis plant? You know, so you have to have a, uh, you know, like a police officer could identify, yes, that's marijuana. I say potentially because, of course, with all of this stuff, he has the opportunity to present a defense to disprove it, right? I mean, he has that opportunity to say, no, it fits one of the exceptions. And that's that's what I, I guess the crux of the argument is here is that, you know, those exemptions, which have been there, at least the first one has been there since 1977 in the Luganville case when this kind of first came up. Um, those have always been there, and they should be treated as as an affirmative defense rather than something the state has to disprove, Um since Luganville, no, no, no court has ever said that the state has to disprove this whole laundry list of things to also prove this marijuana. The state proves it's marijuana by meeting the first part of the of the uh, of the definition, and then once the state has made its prima facie case, well, then it's incumbent incumbent upon the defendant if if he wants to say it's it's one of those exemptions, he has to raise that as an affirmative defense. So then he could argue that look, it's not. Uh, it, it's below the threshold that's industrial hemp. And, and ultimately that might become a, a question for the jury, but it doesn't, that cutoff does not, it's not a hard rule that says if it's if it's above this cutoff, it is marijuana. If it's below this cutoff, it's not. That's just an indicator. And if it's below that threshold, it could be industrial hemp, 
but <laughs> that's a question then for the jury. That's a, that's a that's a burden that the, that the defendant would have to prove as an affirmative defense, and the jury would have to make that decision. It's not a. Um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, a DUI, you know, we have this, you know, if you, if you blow, what is it, 0 0.08, you know, you're over the legal limit and, and it's kind of, you're, you're driving under the influence. But you know what, even if you're under that, you could still be, at least in theory, convicted of, of driving under the influence. If, you know, if you're 0.07, but you still can't drive, if you're, if you're crashing into cars, or whatever, you, st you fail a field sobriety test, you could still be convicted of driving under the influence. Uh, in fact, you don't have to have the breath test. Right. I mean, just based on the field sobriety test and observations of the police officers and so on, you could convict somebody of, of DUI. Same thing here. I mean, yeah, the, the THC level, it it is a definite indicator. It's evidence, but it's not the the end all be all. Right. That was, I think, the the the, uh, the import of, of the Pritchett case. And I think in this in this case, the Court of Appeals adequately you know, synthesized both Lugan Bill and Pritchett and, and uh, other case law saying basically, yeah, that's. THC level is evidence, but it's not the only evidence. Uh, and the these exemptions that are in the in the uh, um, definition and the statute defining marijuana are akin to affirmative defenses. I think the reasoning of the Court of Appeals was was spot on. It was logical, sensible, and would not lead to absurd results, which is what would happen if if you went with my opposing counsel's theory. And so I would ask the court to affirm the Court of Appeals, find that the evidence was sufficient in this case. Thank you. How do you reserve three minutes? Uh, may it please the court. Uh, the, the one main point I want to drive home is TH. So we have science and then we have the law. And under the law of Kansas, THC is absolutely not an indicator that a substance is marijuana. THC is not found in the definition. Uh, even if you prove that it has more than the 0 0.3 threshold, all you're proving is it's not industrial hemp. You still have to prove it comes from the cannabis plant. Uh, so I just want to make make that clear. And in, unless there's any other questions, I'll I'll rest on my briefs. I, I get. I'm just still struggling with your argument about why the officer's testimony that this was marijuana just doesn't hurt, stop. It is just a hard stop on everything. Um, because as I understood you to say, that is because marijuana. Uh, does not include using the statutory language. But um, if the officer said it's marijuana, then that incorporates anything that would come into making it meet the definition of marijuana. And there, so we have an affirmative statement on the record, maybe wrong, may not have been under the analysis, but it's still there that went to the jury that this is marijuana. Sure. So I respectfully disagree that when we have a definition, you can no longer say that a substance is, it's just like Mrs. Clark in fifth grade. When they provide us a definition, we can no longer say a substance is a substance because it's a substance. Your example would work for every other substance in the, in the Control Substance Act that has no definition. Once they provide that definition, simply saying something is marijuana does not mean it's marijuana any longer. I, I disagree that testimony that something is marijuana by itself, uh, just saying, if, if they just say, based on my training and experience, this uh, substance alleged to be marijuana is marijuana, does not satisfy that because we have no idea what, what they're basing that on. If, they, if there was other testimony that said, my training and experience is that substances from the cannabis plant are marijuana. But what if the <laughs> first question had been, do you know the legal definition of marijuana? Yes, I do. What did you find in the defendant's pocket? I found a marijuana cigarette. You're saying that would completely change your argument? If they testified what they knew the definition of marijuana to be, then we have evidence. That's what I just that's what I just asked. If if the if the counsel says, "Do you know the legal definition?" The officer says, "Yes." And gets followed up with, "I mean, wouldn't that utterly erase your argument?" So I disagree a little bit. I think we still need to have evidence, a nexus between what they think the definition is and what the actual definition is. Those are just evidentiary questions. Sorry. Uh, I agree. I mean, maybe I'm getting off course here, but in this case, we have no evidence, no testimony, whether proper testimony or improper, about what the marijuana, what the alleged marijuana, what planet came from. 
And that's that's my argument is that it because the legislature provided definition that ends the case and there's insufficient evidence. I mean, that's my in the, in the simplest terms I can put it in. That's my argument. If there's no other questions, I just ask this court to reverse on insufficient evidence, please. Thank you. Your Honor. Thank you to both counsel. The court will take this matter under advisement.